We're glad you've chosen to listen to our weekly talkback. The weekly talkback is designed to take a portion of the teaching from this week to a deeper level. You may want to listen to this week's teaching, but it isn't necessary to understand the weekly talkback. If you'd like to connect further, feel free to reach out to us through our website, kanoichurch.org. For now, enjoy the weekly talkback from Kanoi Church, where our mission is to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. Well, with a new sermon comes some new ideas and topics. And so the first thing I want to talk about after this morning's sermon is the idea of prophecy. The idea of prophecy is something that we're going to engage again and again in this series because it's important for us to really understand what prophecy is and what it isn't. First, prophecy is not some sort of uh, forecasting of the future. Yes, prophecy absolutely does talk about the future. In the New Testament, when we talk about the word prophet, the word prophet, it's a Greek word, actually is the combination of two Greek words. One word is phemi, and it means to make one's thoughts known or to declare something. And the other word is pra, and that just means before or in front of or for. And so when you combine these words together, the sense that you get is that the person, the prophet, their responsibility is to be a foreteller, a teller or a declarer of God's thoughts before they come to fruition, which may sound like a forecasting of the future, but it's more of an early warning system. In the book of Jeremiah, we have probably the best description that we could possibly have on what prophecy is. So Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 5 is where it starts. It says this, Then the Lord gave this message, O Israel, can I not do to you as this potter has done to his clay? As the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand. If I announce that a certain nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down, and destroyed. But then that nation renounces its evil ways. I will not destroy it as I had planned. And if I announce that I will build up and plant a certain nation or kingdom, making it strong and great, but then that nation turns to evil and refuses to obey me, I will not bless that nation as I had said I would. So we have a God who is intimately involved in what's happening in the world. So let's just fast forward a little bit. We have this thing called the incarnation, and that is when God becomes man. The name Emmanuel, which the angel gave to Mary and said, I want you to call your son Emmanuel, that word, that name means God with us. God descends into human form, descends down to humans as the man Jesus. When we see Jesus, when we hear him talk, when we read what is written about him, when we see the way he interacts with people, Jesus is the perfect representation of God. So we know that Jesus, which is the incarnation, will show us that God has always been incarnational, which means that there's an incarnational God, a God with us, a God who is among us, a God who is standing with us in the stuff of everyday life. We see this in Jeremiah when Jeremiah describes the role of a prophet being to declare what God has said before it happens, but God reserves the right to react to however the people are acting. So, All of that being said, prophecy talks about the future as a way to change the present. Prophecy talks about the future as a way to change the present. Is it possible for a prophecy to come true? Absolutely. So for instance, if God says, O Israel, Repent of your wicked idol worship, or Babylon will come and destroy you. This would be a prophetic word. It's talking about the future. It has a prediction of Babylon coming and destroying Israel. But 
the primary concern of the statement is for Israel to repent of their idol worship. So it's kind of an if-then statement. We call that a conditional statement. If Israel repents, Babylon will not come and destroy them. If Israel doesn't repent, Babylon's going to come and destroy them. There's a statement that is conditional upon some action within it. A prophecy, again, talks about the future as a way to change the present. Now, one of the other things we talked about in our sermon this morning is the fact that Jesus refers to himself in Revelation as the one who moves among the seven lampstands. So this goes back to the idea I was just explaining about how God is incarnational. God has always been incarnational. Jesus shows us that he is, as the incarnation, that God has always been incarnational. And then in Revelation, we have a picture of God, of Jesus, who is actively moving among the seven lampstands, which are our churches of Asia, and is aware of what's going on. He's aware of the good and he's aware of the bad. And in the church we looked at this morning, the church of Ephesus, we see that this church has lost its first love. It's essentially, and I compared it to the book by Peter Greer called Mission Drift, they have drifted from their original mission. In the sermon this morning, we talked about how the original mission of the church of Ephesus, or at least the, the first love of the church of Ephesus, was the way they loved God and the way they loved one another. And we said those two things are inextricably linked. You can't have one without the other. If you don't love people well, then you're not loving God well. If you truly love God, then you're going to love people. So you can't have one without the other. Now, the church is the bride of Christ. That's the name it's given in the New Testament writings. The church is the bride of Christ which is kind of a beautiful image of what church should be. But now I want you to think about the brides of our day here and now. And we have a term that uh, we would use for a bride who is being exceptionally difficult or wanting their own way or um, not being very representative of the love that we assume a bride and groom have of one another, and we would call a bride like this Bridezilla. Yeah? You with me? Okay, so the church is supposed to be the bride of Christ, but what it ends up often being is the Bridezilla of Christ. The church should be this uh, amazing, complementary a spousal pair with Jesus. We know that Jesus loved, for God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son to die on a cross for the world. We know that Jesus so loved the world that he, in a garden, he prayed and he prayed, uh, he, he sweated drops of blood while he prayed for the disciples, while he prayed for the world, while he prayed for all the disciples that would someday come, and that would be you and me. God loves the world so much he sends Jesus, and Jesus loves the world so much he's willing to die. He's willing to submit to the will of the Father to die on a cross for the world. Which means that the bride of Christ should be an amazing image that reflects this. And somehow the church is often going in a direction that looks more like a bridezilla than a bride more like we want our own way uh, rather than Jesus' way, rather than being some sort of a, a couple who comes together to make decisions together, who is invested in the good and whole welfare of the other person, the church goes ahead and makes the decisions by itself and seems to reflect a selfishness rather than a godliness or a Christ-centered approach to things. This is what we have to watch out for here and now today. We need to make sure that our church is reflecting who Jesus is to the world. And rather than being a bridezilla, 
we need to fully embrace that the church is the bride of Christ. And as a community, as a group of, of individual believers that come together and make up the church, we need, we need to hold this community accountable to representing Jesus well. And not in a way that is mean and nasty and where we are just glorified umpires trying to call people out. Because what we've done, and I mentioned this in the sermon today, is we've made all the wrong things so hard. We've made it about the way you dress. We've made it about the way that your children behave or don't behave in church. We've made it about the church building and how nice it is. We've made it about serving on certain committees and kind of adding that to the list of all the things you've done today and last year and the last 10 years of being involved in a church. We've made it about all these ridiculous things that are way too hard. And the thing that actually matters, we let people have a pass on constantly. And the thing that matters is the way that we love. So as a church, we need to hold one another accountable. We need to hold our community accountable to loving well. And again, we hold one another accountable in love. Hi, this is Pastor Nick. Thanks for listening. I hope something that you heard today was very helpful. If you want to connect with us further, feel free to check us out on Facebook, Instagram, or our website, kanoichurch.org. Sure, I'm glad we're in this together.